Good afternoon, and welcome to our virtual panel discussion. Uh, today, I'm joined by three digital transformation experts, and we'll talk about how membership-based organizations can innovate during the COVID-19 crisis and how they can come out stronger on the other side. Um, while everyone is, is signing on, I'd like to kick things off with a quick poll and also a couple of housekeeping notes for our attendees. Um, on your screen, you should see a, a poll box pop up with a question. Um, we'd love to know what's been your biggest pain point since the COVID-19 outbreak began. Um, some options are budget cuts or maintaining a growth strategy in times of uncertainty, maybe, maybe pivoting strategy away from in-person events or lacking the right tools to conduct business digitally, whether it's an outdated website or limited channels or something else. Uh, maybe lacking the human resources to conduct business digitally, uh, needing help from strategists or designers or web developers, cutting through the noise and connecting with the right audience online. Maybe it's tracking ROI of new digital channels. Uh, and, and if you have something else that's not listed, uh, please share it in the chat. So I think we'll, um, we'll have some answers in just a minute. Uh, I'm excited to, to see what everyone's thoughts are on this. Um, I think uh, the answers that we get will help frame the discussion today. So um, some, some quick housekeeping notes while you are answering. First, um, a quick reminder that this webinar is being recorded. Uh, and secondly, we encourage you to submit your questions for our panelists throughout today's discussion. Uh, you can use Zoom's Q&A feature. And we also encourage you to introduce yourself and share comments in the chat uh, that is at the bottom of your screen in Zoom. Uh, our team will collect the questions that you ask and we'll share as many of them as time permits um, with the, the panelists. Um, we'll do that at the end of the discussion, so maybe around uh, 150 or so Eastern. So we've got some results in. Um, it looks like one of the, the most difficult things uh, was pivoting strategy away from in-person events. Uh, almost half of you listed that as your, your top concern. Uh, we also saw pretty heavily represented we're maintaining a growth strategy in times of uncertainty, almost a third of you. Uh, about a fifth of you said cutting through the noise and connecting with the right audience online. Uh, and just behind that was budget cuts. So uh, some, uh, some great answers there. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone who did answer. And based on, on what we heard, I think today's discussion will be highly relevant. Uh, so I'm excited to dig in. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Ben Slavin. Uh, I'm the Senior Vice President of Strategy and Design at Mindgrub. We're a full service digital agency and software consultancy, and we're based in Baltimore. We specialize in web and mobile development, user experience and interactive design, branding, and digital marketing. I'm joined today by Carolyn Hilliard, Senior Marketing Manager at ASAE the Center for Association Leadership. ASAE is a membership organization of more than 44,000 association executives and helps associations and association professionals transform society through the power of collaboration. Next up is Garth Moore. Garth is the Senior Vice President of Digital Strategy at GMMB. An agency on a mission, GMMB uses communications expertise to contribute to healthier kids, better schools, fairer laws and elected leaders who will drive our society forward. And third, we have Mike Wassenaar, the president and CEO of the Alliance for Community Media, the organization that supports, promotes and defends public educational and government access television in the United States. Finally, uh, I wanna quickly turn it over to David Gertler, the CEO and co-founder of Treble Network. David has a few words to share about Treble, which is a MindGrub portfolio company and the sponsor company of today's virtual uh, speaker series. David. Thanks, Ben. Uh, I'm so glad to be here and thank, thank you for uh, organizing this. And I'm really excited to hear from the panel. I'll just take one minute to tell everybody a little bit about uh, Treble. Treble is a business networking platform. For business professionals, Treble empowers people to leverage their network for new business opportunities and for career development. For business networking organizations, like tech councils, alumni associations, chambers of commerce, other professional societies, Treble creates a more altruistic community and provides metrics which quantify the value of membership by showing the introductions, referrals, jobs, deals, clients, customers, and other business opportunities that are created inside your association. 
And in virtual networking environment, there's nothing better than Treble's meeting manager to help your members stay connected, leverage a network, help each other, and continue to creating a vibrant community between and before we all get together in in-person events. If you're interested in learning more, please contact me at first to know at treblenetwork.com. Thanks everybody. And I'm looking forward to a great discussion. Thanks so much, David. Uh, thanks for sharing a little bit about Treble and the important networking platform that you're building. So with that, uh, let's dive in. To kick off our discussion today, I'd like to talk a little bit about the end of the year. I think we all know that year end is a hectic time for associations and nonprofits every year but this year is challenging in a new way. We know that the pandemic and the recession have dramatically changed the landscape for associations and nonprofits in 2020. Uh, and we've heard positive news about vac vaccines becoming available. But Garth, what do you think uh, membership organizations can expect in 2021? A return to event-based fundraising and word of mouth growth, or is Digital First here to stay? Um, well, I think digital first is somewhat here to stay. Um, and uh, I, I love conferences just as much as anyone. I, I feel almost robbed this year that I didn't get an opportunity to be in person with my colleagues and other contemporaries and talk and share strategies and ideas. And I think those will come back because we are social animals and we're meant to be together in person. Um, I don't think that we're going to necessarily get past COVID even in the first two quarters of this next year. I think there's still going to be safety concerns. There still will be a vaccine rollout that we'll need to manage. And I think organizations really need to come to the terms that there's no such thing as the real world and the online world anymore, or the digital world and the real world. That bifurcation is gone. Um, your reputation, the way you manage relationships, the way you communicate is all done online. So even when you get back to that Q3, Q4, and maybe you have some of your annual events towards the end of next year, uh, the way that you're going to procure your audience, the way that you're going to relate to them, and the things that you can do even in the first two quarters of next year, if not an annual meeting, just communicating with your audiences, even in smaller batches, needs to be done online. So even thinking digital first, it, it should almost be digital primary should be your thinking. And that the tools and resources that you're using for digital are your communication resources. They are how you manage your reputation and your communications. Great, thanks Garth. And I, I've heard from others that uh, those in-person meetings and, and the, the physical convening, uh, some, some people felt that they had a superpower in those spaces and this feels like they've they've lost a superpower so building a new digital superpower uh, is something that uh, we can maybe focus on as we talk through today so um carolyn uh, i'd like to address the next question to you um asae is in a unique position in the association space and that position gives you a great view into the state of the industry I'm wondering what are some of the things that you're hearing right now from your member executives and how does what you're hearing relate to this concept of digital transformation? Um, I, I think, well, sorry, go ahead. No, thank you. And thank you for having me today. I'm very excited to be here and part of the panel. Um, you are right. ASAE does have a insight into what executives and leaderships throughout associations are going through. They turn to ASAE as their guidance and their leadership and really look to us to enable them to push on and move forward. And what we've been hearing back is the transformation from manual processes and a lot of things that were previously being done, especially, you know, from in-person strategy of a conference to then transforming that strategy into a virtual conference. They have found it very difficult and um, the roadblocks of really trying to find the right platforms trying to find the right guidance and really leveraging it to stay engaged. And I think everything that we pulled on um, really falls exactly into the bucket of, you know, budgeting, 
platforms, leveraging um, leveraging other tools, as well as being able to continue to stay true to their values and their brand by that transformation. Great, thanks, Carolyn. I think it's safe to say that none have expected this year to play out as it did. I'm wondering, Mike, from your perspective, um, what are some of the ways your organization adapted to changing constituent expectations? Well, I mean, we had to manage the expectations about canceling our live event. Our live event was supposed to take place um, in June of 2020. And we had to actually manage the contract for the, the event hotel at the same time we were promoting the event and then also trying to find a, a virtual alternative. So we're, we're really sort of juggling three balls in the air as you're basically managing audience expectations and trying to figure out how to, how to make things work. And this, you have to remember in the spring, COVID conditions across the country were, were very much fluid and very much changing. So it was very much a regional issue as opposed to, I think, a national issue now. And I think in some respects, planning for 2021 is a lot easier because I can just expect that there will not be any live events where, where you have in-person, face-to-face networking. And you have to be thinking about virtual events you know, you know, in either a live or a recorded setting. But that you know, poses some other challenges, right? Um, I've got members in four different time zones uh, separated by uh, six hours when um, uh, daylight savings time is in, in place in America. So then I've got to be thinking about how I'm coordinating logistically in, in the lives of all of my members and their lives, I think we have to, can't, have, have to remember this, have been pushed into turmoil just about as every person's life has been in, in the United States in, in the last, uh, the last eight, eight, nine months. So their work experiences and their work expectations are very, very different. So. It, it, it has meant that we have almost become like an on-call agency where we do drop-in windows to do, you know, sort of in, informal as well as formal counseling with, with our members um, on issues, but then even just sort of like stressors that they have to be thinking about all the time. Um, so, you know, our role as, a, as an association is to support our members' success but that means I think that we become sort of like virtual coaches almost in, in that work. Um, so that's kind of changed the expectation, I think, for a lot of the work that I do and that, that our staff does is they're, they're supporting our members on a day to day basis. You know, um, and it's, it's been a, a huge challenge, and, uh, but it's been also pretty exciting in some ways. Yeah, I, I love that concept that, that you're using of, of those digital drop-ins, a chance to, to keep um, a sense of that face-to-face -face interaction I wonder, uh, Mike, if you have anything that you can share in terms of your use um, across multiple digital channels. Are there any that you've found to be successful and uh, is there anything you can share about coordinating across channels? Well, I mean, in our, in our experience, we, we, you almost have to find ways to tailor to the, the user experience, right? So um, we, we have a number of our, our members, for example, that are municipal, municipal agencies and they, they are working in a certain environment and they can't use Zoom. Actually, it's kind of strange. Um, many cities and counties have actually banned the use of Zoom because of security expectations and, and Zoom bombing that occurred early on in the, in the course of the pandemic. Um, we primarily rely on Zoom and, and, and use that as sort of a, a universe because we find that most everybody within our, our universe is comfortable with it at some, some point. Um, but we have to be able to be cognizant of Google Hangouts, uh, the Microsoft Teams <laughs> environment shows up every once in a while. You have, to be, you have to be thinking through that a little bit in terms of just the, the, the user experience. I think it also means that we have to be doing almost like in tutorials or instructions to remind people how to act together in that virtual environment. Um, you know, not unlike what you did at the, the, top of the top of the order here, but almost have to remind people how to engage on the platform because the user experiences uh, across, uh, even, even amongst professionals is highly varied. Um, so you just have to be, just remember to go slow, be kind to one another and keep smiling. Great, thanks Mike. Uh, Carolyn, I'd like to direct uh, sort of this similar, uh, a similar question to you uh, with respect to ASAE. Um, I, I'm wondering where you and your team have found success this year when it comes to the 
with transformation to digital and how you've uh, embraced technology to, um, to continue to provide value to your members. Absolutely. And I think the biggest uh, word out of that is team. In this period of transforming to digital, we have all relied on each other. Each of us have brought a different strength. And I actually joined ASAE two days before we went completely remote. And I came from a strong background of digital automation and email platforms. So I came heavy in with the background of technology, whereas other teammates that I work with had not. So we embraced the first of it really when it came to our virtual annual meeting, which is a huge driver for us, especially with non-members and converting. Um, we just pulled the numbers for that and I can speak on that um, later, but it was you know, choosing the platform. Did we find success? In that, I think, you know, when it turns to defining success, it really turns to the data driven, you know, decisions beyond, you know, the success and the ROI. We have found success um, by utilizing multiple channels, including doing podcasts. I think being able to leverage not only social media, but video, live chats, you know, not just webinars, but being able to also have, um, you know, respondents of a personalized level and um, different areas also has really helped the success and the health engagement within the membership and non-members in those touch points we have put together on pacing. But automation, we, I mean, as we all know, automation in any field, digital association, B2B is essential. And I think that success can only grow from that. And if you're growing from learning that in which ASAE has grown from the learning period, it, it really has been implemented. But as you mentioned, team and working with your team to get to that point of digital technology is huge. Thanks, Carolyn. And I, I think the, the first half of your uh, your comments there set us up well for uh, another topic that I was, I was hoping to talk about, um, which is that I know we're here on Zoom and, and we're all experiencing Zoom fatigue after months of video meetings and calls. So I'm wondering, in addition to some things that Carolyn just mentioned, um, aside from Zoom meetings, what are some of the ways that you've been able to maintain engagement, uh, both among your internal team and among your members? And Garth, I wonder maybe if you can share uh, some of the tools other than Zoom that uh, that you're using both internally and uh, as you work with um, with member organizations. Um, well, <clears throat> internally, um, I, I I find to just have team and one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, are essential, and to have those kind of individual touch points, um, the same that I would in person, and and try to make sure that there's time for cooler talk, water cooler talk. Uh, at the start of meetings and then in one-on-one -on -one meetings and don't just get right into it and try to ditch some of the formalities so that you can build that rapport because this does get difficult. You know, we're all so far away, even in the same city, we're all sitting in our own individual spaces, could be months before we see each other again. So trying to make that informality work with the team so that you can hopefully drop any kind of pretenses and, and, and do those things that you would normally do sitting in a room, brainstorm, talk about new ideas, kind of get that conversational flow going so that you can have productive meetings. Um, with member associations, I, I really do think they need to, uh, so Carolyn mentioned uh, something about email and social as well. Um, you almost have to, there's a couple of things that I think associations need to do uh, and really do need to think about in terms of having a, a mindset of being always on or having an always on state. And that doesn't mean being ubiquitous across every social media channel, 
But what it means is finding those channels where you know your audiences are, where your members are, where you can talk to them and engage with them. Don't treat channels like a broadcast channel. Treat them as a way to converse the same way you would for your personal Facebook channel, for example. If you're on LinkedIn, if you're on Twitter, um, engage with those member organizations, engage with uh, um, any of your members, um, talk to them, respond to them. Um, your brand can certainly be much more human in terms of how you engage with them. And while you still should have your meetings and, and more of your kind of digital drop-ins, which I love that idea, as opposed to maybe the big annual event, which we can talk about later, but um, along with all of these things, there's still going to be some Zoom. We're still going to have some Zoom fatigue. But if you can look at your channels as a way to start a conversation and start an engagement point where then you can take those things maybe over to email, maybe over to phone calls, um, you're going to do a lot better by your members as opposed to just broadcasting or waiting for those three or four big tentpole moments to do outreach with them. And so try to always get in that spirit of using your channels to think about how to have a conversation more than broadcasting news or information about what you're doing. Thanks, Garth. And that sense of human connection um, is something that we've heard a lot about. About And Mike, in just a moment, I, I wonder if maybe you can tell us a little bit more about those drop-in meetings. But one of the things that, that we've seen is finding ways to use technology and digital solutions to deepen the human connection. Because that, that really is something that in the first months of the, the pandemic especially, seem to be missing from that sense of engagement. So, yeah, so Mike, I, yeah. please go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead, Ben. Go well, that's your, your concept of these digital drop-ins uh, that, that I think you've come up with, with a way to uh, shape them so that you can capture some of that human connection. I wonder if you could tell us more about that. Sure, so, I mean, the, the, they're, they're meant to be short. So I would book, book a half hour maybe three times a week. And then I, I and then because we have a, a national audience, um, I would vary the time zones um, times. So, you know, um, I tend to end up doing a lot of afternoon work because I have to work with both Hawaiians and uh, Mainers. So I end up having to, you know, sort of trying to find times at various points in time during the course of the work week. Keeping in mind now that the work week is sort of smeared for everybody from 5 a.m. to, midnight now it seems like um and then and then literally you know uh put out reminders both on our, our list serves uh, through our newsletters um through other you know uh, electronic means like linkedin or, or or twitter depending on what the channel is keeping in mind that people don't all use the same channels to be able to connect with one another um and then simply i mean this is kind of my going back to my radio days and you know what Garth said about having a warm up build rapport is extremely important you know the first 5 to 10 minutes of an interview you learned from radio many many years ago is kind of like you know what'd you have for breakfast how's the day going what's going on with the kids the dog barking in the background you know i got to work on my laundry blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it's all these sort of rapport building things that happen but it's extremely important because People need to be able to trust one another in, in any kind of communication environment. But certainly in this kind of environment, um, you don't know. I mean, sometimes you're meeting people for the first time virtually. So, you know, you've got to find ways to be able to build trust and rapport. To a certain extent, then, you know, I think it means asking folks, having someone who acts, 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 as, acts as an interlocutor, if you will, you know, what have been the successes this week? What have been the challenges? I mean, even just something simple as, you know, how's your life going this week? You know, they, there's something extremely human. Um, and then also share, share some of your own reflections in terms of like things that are happening in the world around you. It, it means a lot for people in that kind of environment. And then, you know, the, the, the last rule that I had, it was like anything goes. We could talk about anything personally or professionally that you want to share with other people uh, online. So the thing that's very curious is that it would go from like, you know, people concerned about their health or their families you know, the, the stress levels they're feeling taking in a, in a small town environment, for example, to um, finding way, you know, technical, technical solutions, professional vendors, references, how to navigate PPP loans, all those sort of things came up in the course of conversation during the course of this last year. Um, but you only do that by having an open agenda and having people want to share with one another. And then and then being used to the idea that you will have a different audience every 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 day, which was kind of refreshing to see. There was like you know different people on a Tuesday, 
different people on a Friday, <laughs> you know, um, and, you know, on Friday, if you did it at 5 p.m. Eastern, there might be cocktails involved. So, you know, those types of, just being open to that is extremely important. That's great. And that concept of an open agenda, I think, is so powerful. Uh, you know, but you have to be careful because people don't just sort of volunteer, th volunteer things. You almost have to have the open agenda and have the, have the time, but then you have to know a little bit about the people in the room to be able to elicit that. Program. Yes. That's great. So I'd like to, to switch gears for a moment and talk a little bit more about the, the financial side of, uh, of this topic. And we've seen that many of the revenue drivers for associations and nonprofits, whether that's member contributions or conference attendance, um, exhibitor fees, grants, fundraising events, um, they've all been negatively impacted by COVID. And we know that the digital transformation that's needed to create new revenue streams and improve operational efficiency requires a sense of investment. Mm -hmm. Garth, I know that you work with associations and can help balance some of these priorities or provide advice to. I wonder what are some of the ways that associations can navigate this situation from a strategic perspective? I think strategically, um, you need to invest in the digital tool sets that you need to run your organization. Um, I still kind of can't believe I'm saying that in 2020, but it's true. Um, and I've seen some organizations <laughs> put digital on the back burner. Uh, and now, as you're seeing from this year, um, you need to have it on all burners all the time. You need to figure out how you're bringing in your revenue strings, what software you have to uh, record those revenue streams or to gather up revenue in some way to record those in constituent relationship management systems so that you can procure these relationships. Um, all of these tools need to be there. There are a lot of tools out there. There are a lot of great groups like ASAE who can help you, you know, find those tools. Um, but you really do need to make the investment in those tool sets and don't think of them as you know, something that you're going to have to, you know, have an immediate ROI for. Get them in place, procure those relationships, and then you're going to move those things. Because, you know, really, in, in, in terms of the way that you're going to be dealing with your members now in a digital format, um, you're going to want them to find value in what you do. So when you're asking them for their dues, when you're asking them to attend maybe smaller online events, so instead of instead of spending a very large amount to attend a very big conference, you can have a lot of small digital gatherings for a smaller fee. You're gonna to wanna to have those systems in place to kind of gather those things and to do all the kind of, you know, sifting through grants and making sure that you have software to take on those grants and to look at those and a number of different things. So don't, in terms of a digital transformation, if you're not there yet, Take the time to find strategists within your organization and outside your organization to really help you kind of put together the digital mechanisms that you need for this transformation, transformation so that you're a, you're, you're a digital first or digital primary shop and that you've got all of your, all your plates spinning for when you're gonna need them. Because even when we come out of COVID, this is the way that a lot of business is still gonna be done. And I wonder, um, Carolyn, given your position at ASAE, um, that balance between impact to, to revenue generating activities, but requiring an investment to, to really move some of these initiatives forward. Is there any advice that, that you give uh, in your role? A hundred percent. And this is actually gonna tag on with what Garth said as into what ASAE can provide in that transformation and in that decision-making process and not really looking at the ROI, but really diving into a solution. I manage our business solutions, which has definitely revamped which offers associations the guidance the tools the coaching they need to help guide them through this period of time so with event cancellation and i know i believe um it was mike who probably brought it up earlier that with event cancellation and the contracting a lot of people don't realize that 
that is not in the contract if the event gets canceled. So, you know, our insurance line runs through that. And, and we have that investment sector as well as, you know, the digital side where we help guide and nurture folks, you know, and it's not a buy, buy, buy. We sincerely want associations to go through this transformation seamlessly. And with the help of our partners of, you know, high roads and with passageways and on board who also do virtual platforms, you know, it's a really great place that I can say to any association executive, any leader out there to really help them because we use the tools that we have there. They're ASAE endorsed and we sincerely stand by them. We use them and it has taken us just as any association, it has taken us a bit to get in the groove, but you fail until you don't fail. And that is something that with the automation and the digital and the touches and the personalization that you just have to invest in. Great. Uh, I'd, I'd actually love to keep this next question with you, Carolyn, as we move into marketing and marketing strategy. Absolutely. Um, I wonder uh, how have you or how will you adjusted your messaging or your overall marketing roadmap to continue to attract new members? during this time? Absolutely. So during this time, it's adjusting day by day. And really these adjustments are happening based on brand approved adjustments that are becoming digital, but they are data driven decisions. And it's really come down to our audience and that's the only way and going back to being you know more personal more one-on-one -on -one, the only way that we've been able to continue to have healthy engagement and to keep members you know on top and of mind is you know, reminding them and keeping them in a light with the right tone in our message, making everything easy and friendly. But noting that being a member, it's not only, you know, a membership and you're getting these perks, but it's an impact every day. And it is reminding them the benefits, the goals the rewards that are received by their membership. As far as hitting non-members, um, we have really found that after especially going through the year that with maybe too much time in certain areas, especially when it comes to, you know, free conferences and, Usually it, it's members that get the no fees, but we have been, you know, just like everybody, we're, we're trying to figure out, you know, what's working, what's not, you know, where to effectively and efficiently spend our time. And after pulling those analytics and numbers, we have seen that we shouldn't have spent so much time in certain areas because it was free and the conversion did not happen. So we are really taking it to another level. And our membership team has, um, and it, it, they can't be on the streets. They can't be, you know, really in the field, but they're picking up phones. They're calling people. And this is another thing that's not digital. But I will say a lot of us have our members and our prospective members' home addresses. And I heard this on a, another, um, another webinar, and it really stuck with me. And it, I'm a huge, huge, you know, 
no investment in mailers. I am against them. I don't want them. We all know what happens. They tear up, throw them in the trash. Well, right now, people are sick of reading emails. Either your email stands out or it gets shut down. And I think a bulky mailer to the folks at home is another channel, even though it's not digital, it is another channel that I think will help keep that engagement as a touch point um, for membership growth and engagement. Thanks, Carlin. Mike, I'd love to ask the same question to you. So, um, you know, uh, I mean, a lot of what Carolyn's talking about really resonates with me. I tell you a little bit about some of the stuff we run into this last year. But I guess the first thing I tell everyone is just to sort of slow down because everybody you're talking to is getting hit by a bajillion messages, <laughs> right? I mean, and it's not just, it's not just business related. It's, it's, there's school, oh, yeah. the school, schools giving you, giving you, you know, multiple uh, text messages about alerts. It's uh, <laughs> the county executive come cha changing, changing COVID restrictions. It's this, it's that, the other thing. Oh, and the election took place this year. So, I mean, it, it, it was, it's been a stressful communication environment. So keep breathing, don't give up your communication by email, but, it, but know that there's a fire hose of emails coming at people right now. So, uh, I mean, I don't know what the, what the statistics look like, but just, just anecdotally talking with my members, Poor. It's, it's almost impossible to, to reach them at their work phones because they're not at work, they're at home, so you need to have an alternate list. So you keep thinking about sort of multiple channels to reach people and then manage your communication timelines to take more time and expect that it you will be less efficient, right? Because of the, the stressed environment that everybody's in. So that's, that's the sort of first thing. I think the second thing that we've been thinking about is, is that the non-member marketing piece. Um, I mean, we've been really trying to make sure that we're hanging on to our members because uh, they're, they're under a lot of financial stress. So we need to make sure that there's a really clear value proposition of why they're members, what they're getting out of it, both the professional and personal relationships, as well as the ROI that they have for their work, for the, you know, work, work strategies or, or work practices or vendor relationships or vendor discounts, things like that. But, you know, the non-member communication, the first thing is we need to make sure that we, we've got very good information about who those targets are that we're trying to reach out for conversion. Um, for a long time, we had a very sort of wild and hairy list. Um, and I, I, you know, it wasn't clear that it wasn't clear that the you know the communication going to those non-members was targeted, was well thought out, um, and they were getting good response. Um, and that's even for you know our big awards programs that, that drive a lot of non-member traffic. Um, so you know, we we hired an intern this summer to do a directory project to document uh, all 1,700 organizations. Uh, that are possible targets of, of our membership be, that are doing that sort of core operational work with accurate data in terms of their contact information, whether or not they do have email or not, all this sort of stuff. So then we can sort of structure our non member communication more accurately. I mean, so just, you know, uh, that, that research about knowing who your target is, I think is the most important first step or targets, targets are. And then think about how you can find them. I mean, and I, I, I never was a street corner singer, but I, I, I know that you know, uh, if, you stand a, if you stand on a busy street corner, you'll get more quarters dropped into the bucket um, than if you're in a, in a non-busy street corner. So, I mean, just thinking about those types of things um, helped to sort of really have sort of helped us to sort of change our communication strategy and think through you know, how we're trying to convert people over time. The last thing I tell you, you know, um, you know, having this sort of like personal connection strategy can work with non-members as well. We're, we're starting a series of, of meetups that would be for both in our industry that are both for members and non-members um, as a way to build relationship, particularly on a statewide level for markets that we don't have a lot of in-reach in. We maybe, you know, there, there's probably like 60 targets in a certain state. But we have maybe three or four members. So we want to start sort of trying to find ways to build community amongst those groups based upon, you know, what's convenient for them. And I think the strategy for that series is going to be, you know, talk about your successes, share, share your successful strategies with others who are your neighbors. And our, our thought process is, is that if you're, you know, since we're, we have 50 states, I would rather have, you know, the Hawaiians talk with the Hawaiians 
rather than the Hawaiians talk with the South Carolinians, which is kind of a fun <laughs> exercise, but you know, <laughs> it, it doesn't it, it doesn't get to the commonality of experiences as much. Um, so that's you know, but that's kind of the way we're trying to build community amongst non-members to be able to get the conversion eventually. That's great. Thank you for for the insight and, and the advice, um, Garth. I'd love to, to ask you a little bit about. Um, I, I know you think a lot about brand in the context of strategic response, and so I wonder: Do you have any thoughts on how organizations can grow in the current circumstances? Um, in terms of strategic response um, and and just being there for your members. Again, I talked a little bit about that always on principle. Um, you know, recognize your brand for what it is, for who you are, your voice, and the value that you give your members and start from there. Um, you know, brands are very pliable. Um, most people think they do one thing and they communicate about one thing to their members about this one certain area. But brands are very pliable in that you can talk about multiple things with your audiences. Um, meaning you don't have to just talk about a little bit about the membership course over here. You can talk about ways that you can provide value to them, give them insights, give them feedback on what they're doing, um, offer different ideas or tactics for them, things that they can take in and really start to work with as well. Um, and, and they're going to look for you online. Um, remember, any response um, to anything, people go online now to find answers. Uh, just kind of seek that response. And you want to be there as a few voices. You want to be the expert. You want to be the counselor. You want to be the friend. You want to be uh, the organizations that's managing your members through any of the questions that they're having about whatever it is they're doing. Um, and you want to be able to counsel them and guide them. Um, so again, you know, make sure that you can talk about a lot of different things with them. Don't feel like your social channels or your emails are just stuck on asking for memberships or thinking about events. There's a lot of micro interactions that you can have throughout a day, throughout a week in talking with folks of getting your message out there. And, and look, I know we all wanna cut through the clutter and we're all just being inundated right now by digital messaging, but think about this. When you tweet something, when you post something on LinkedIn or Facebook, roughly anywhere from 10 to 14% of your followers will see that message at any one time. Um, that's just the way these algorithms work and that's just the way that feeds work. And most people don't actually go to your page to look through all of your messages. And that's why when I talk about that engagement on social and you know, the same thing with email, um, using surveys, using feedback, um, even if you're using SMS or something like that, you certainly can do it. But think about those ways that you can get out there. Think about your messaging, think about your content calendars, think about current uh, topics and newsworthy items. Um, expand your brand voice a little bit, expand the things that you're talking about, bring in other voices to help talk to your members and, and really kind of remember that uh, as an organizational brand, you can do a lot with a little in the course of a week and it'll make a big difference in how you start to see the engagement with your members. Great, building, building on that Garth. Um, and I know a crucial part of our marketing strategy here at MindGrub is thought leadership. I wonder if you have any thoughts on uh, how you can encourage thought leadership at the executive or individual employee level to support the development of a, a digital first culture. Well, and we certainly at GMMB this year, we've had numerous trainings um, with um, leaders at organizations who want to do more on social media, who want to do more with their touches on email, um, participating in Zoom calls or in online conferences. And so we've done a lot of training with them. Um, I think, you know, just the same was with the brand. Um, if you're a leader at an organization, you can talk about a lot of different things. Certainly, you are the subject matter expert or the SME in the room. You can certainly talk to everything that your organization is about. Um, and you can propel your organization, which is what you should do. So uh, engaging with your organization online and, and posting their messages into your streams as well. You also want to be able to talk with contemporaries. You also want to be able to talk with your members and your audiences. You want to be able to talk with media. Um, you want to be able to talk with anybody who kind of comes into that universe with the same kind of interest in your subject matter, even if they're not a member. And you want to have that engagement. You want to make sure that's personalized. And that doesn't mean to just use your channels for work. 
You also right. need to be a human being on social media. It's okay to tweet about the football game. It's okay to tweet about your daughter's graduation that was done virtually and then you had a big cake party with, you know, a few <laughs> It's okay to talk about these things. You should talk about these things because they're what make you a person. Your audiences will respond much more to you as a person and as a subject matter expert if you're well-rounded and if you're pliable in that way. And I would also encourage members, uh, organizations looking at their employees, if you have those kind of spokespersons, those people who deal with members who touch on members, to take a look at their social media accounts and give them the trust and the viability to message for your organization. Um, I've seen some organizations that are very wide open and have all the trust in the world and their employees to be those brand ambassadors and subject matter experts for their organizations. And I've seen some that shut them down completely. And I think the ones that do the latter, you really lose something there. Um, it can't just all be on your CEO and it can't all just be on your brand. You've got probably easily five, 10, maybe 15 brand ambassadors, depending on the size of your organization. You need to empower them, empower them to speak for your organization, to speak for your topic matters, to speak to members and really be a voice for your organization. And look, we're all locked down right now. We're all communicating through Zoom meetings and we're communicating through social media. Um, the more that you're getting out there, the more that you're spreading your message and you're expanding your reach and expanding your engagement, the better off your organization is going to be. So when you have those event emails coming over or the fundraising emails coming over, they're going to know those personal touches with you and your brand, your CEO or your in-house experts. And they're going to feel much more comfortable receiving those things because they've had that kind of personal touch with you already. That's, that's some great advice. Um, just keeping an eye on time, I have just uh, a few more minutes for some, some quick questions before we switch over to q and I see we have just a, a couple things that have come in. So Mike, um, just briefly, um, I, I think you might be able to shed some light here. Um, some of our audience is just beginning their journey of digital transformation. And I wonder if you can share some impactful operational or cultural changes they could make to, uh, to support their digital first growth strategy. You know, I think the, the first thing is realizing it's a communication medium. So <clears throat> determine what your what your your end users use. Take a look at what channels are dominant for them. I mean, you may find that based upon their age groups or their regions or mm -hmm. their proclivities or their habits, you know, you've got a lot of folks that are on Instagram right um or or on twitter i mean twitter is typically a more professional space you know um in, in any ways lots of folks maybe you're on fa facebook you actually have to understand that to be able to think through what you're going to deploy you shouldn't deploy everything because you can't do that I mean, <laughs> you know i mean sure start a slack channel but i mean understand <laughs> if, understand if the folks that you're trying to communicate even know what slack is okay so I think a good first step is either to do a survey or, or even, even just sort of a, a, a conversation with randomly picked, you know, 10 people um, from, you know, within your organization about, you know, what they use, why they use it, what are the types of things that they're looking for, what are the types of things that they're sharing. Um, and then, you know, I think one of the things that, that I, I think is really kind of important, if you don't have that voice as your association is necessarily, think about the voice of your members because you know you have some commonality as you know to get to, to, to Garth's point, you have some commonality as a brand together. It's possible for you to be you know sharing the successes of other people in, in, in your field. Um, a really easy tip is to uh, come up with a Google News feed um, mm -hmm. that basically you know gives you a daily digest of events that are happening in your field, you know, choose key terms in your field, um, and then monitor that feed every day. And guess what happens? You'll get you'll get stories that you don't basically didn't know existed from both members and non-members that you can reflect upon, celebrate, dive into, or even cold call people. I mean, you know, gee, I saw that story happening in Aberdeen. I, I had no idea that that was going on. What was it like for you? I mean, find ways to do that kind of engagement. I, I'd say that, you know, that Google News Feed has been just invaluable for me in the last six or seven years because I, I've been able to discover all sorts of relationships that I didn't know I had based upon, based upon 
Google just kind of giving me tips. So, oh, this this happened in the, you know, the Press Gazette today. Well, I don't read the Press Gazette, but I do now. <laughs> so, but just those types of sort of creating sort of almost like an information funnel, so that you can then reflect back and then choose a couple of channels to start out with. Don't choose them all, uh, based upon you know what you how you can almost intensify your experience with people that that should know you. Thanks, Mike. Some great tips in there. Uh, let's wrap it up, uh, with Carolyn. Um, I wonder if if you could share in your opinion, what's the, the biggest reason that now is the time for associations and membership organizations to transition to digital first? Um, first off, I want to say everything that Mike just touched on is so key and I wish I could echo it. And it was fabulous, fabulous pointers. And I really, even myself, appreciated hearing that. But right now, if you're not digital, you're not making healthy and efficient engagement and contact with your members or with prospective non-members. You need to be able to invest, engage, and just let it happen. Because what you find is if nothing changes, nothing changes. And if you stay in the world we were at before March, your transformation is stuck. So if you are not transforming in the digital world, you're behind. And you can always look, you know, to resources such as ASAE and our business solution to help you get there. Great. Um, thank you all for, for your uh, responses during the structured part of the conversation. Um, at this point, we're going to transition over to some Q&A and share some questions from the audience. So I, and, and this is uh, an open question, but I would love to, so this is a question from the audience. I would love to know what is working to keep supplier and vendor members happy. It's a challenge for them to do business in the virtual environment. Uh, had a, uh, and this uh, commenter uh, said, we've had a few virtual events from our convention. it will be virtual in 2020. We were lucky to have our convention in person, uh, sorry, in, in 2021, we were lucky to have our convention in person in 2020. So again, uh, all would love to know what is working to keep supplier and vendor members happy. I can jump in on that. Um, what is working with us and with vendors and suppliers and our partners is continually staying engaged and continually having those conversations with them and setting realistic expectations and setting realistic milestones. So a lot of our vendors or partners, they expect certain types of channels to be hit, certain segments to be hit, you know, this amount, but it's really being able to then go back to digital and show them that we might have missed out on A, but we took advantage of B and we still were able to hit that milestone with these results. So it's more than just saying we did this, but it's backing it up with that data and with that deliverance that you are continually communicating, contacting, and showing them that you're doing A, B, C, and D. Great. We have uh, one more question that's come in. Um, and this one, uh, this might be a loaded question, but have you ever held or attended a virtual event that you thought was valuable? Um, and if so, what was the platform, the content, or something else that made it successful? And I think we all know how uh, difficult it can be to, to pull off. Um, a, a virtual event. I wonder, Mike, if you have any thoughts, and then maybe so, uh, we we uh, organized a, a, a lecture discussion um, in July this year that came from our members that cared deeply about inclusion and diversity issues. And you have to 
kind of put yourself back in the context of how things were uh -huh. early, early summer, post Memorial Day, post George Floyd, um, and, and you know the, the the protests going around around the country. Um, um, and we we put together a speaker series, a speaker um, uh, event and discussions with both a panelist as well as a keynote um, that came from came from our members that cared about this issue area. Um, and it was deeply moving because of the diversity of response and, and the authenticity and the realness of it. So I, I just think, I mean, there's like a bunch of different platforms that are available for, for virtual events. We're, we're evaluating things right now for 2021, right, even as, as we speak. Um, but, it, you know, the thing that's great about the moment is that you have the ability to be able to attract speakers from around the world that you never could if you were having it, your, your meeting in Toledo or you're having your meeting in, in Bismarck or you know, even Washington DC, uh, depending upon the time of year. So I just think there's a huge opportunity to use imagination for that. I, I mean, so that was just so moving uh, that the, 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 uh, we, uh, we had a keynote who, who was basically the, the leader of the Brooklyn Museum on uh, Media was one of our members talking about her, the reason why she's involved in, in media arts and the reason why she's involved as a, as a, as a leader in media arts and it's a sort of a deeply moving discussion. Um, those are the things that, that I remember this from this last year. You know? Earth, do you have I, any, I, any examples? I, I, I've really appreciated the smaller meetings this year. I mean, part of the problem with a big annual meeting or a big convention is there's a lot of things on the docket that you always want to attend and maybe there's competing sessions and you don't always get in. Um, I, I like the fact that things are kind of breaking down in a sense that instead of having one big conversation with a lot of little conversations in this big area, you could, to the digital discussions, you could have these events all year long, have a good sized group for them, bring in the experts, like Mike said, from all over the world and, and kind of string these out where people won't miss a thing. So you can provide a lot of value to your membership by having smaller set um, kind of mini conferences or even just sessions like this over and over again and planning these things out and maybe even duplicating them so you can get East Coast or West Coast, however you'd wanna you know, use your playbook. But uh, certainly you, you don't have to go for the big, big conference. And again, we don't know where COVID is gonna be in 2021. Um, there are a lot of question marks right now in this country and throughout the world. So as you're looking at your 2021 events, Start to think about instead of having that big event, break it down into what are some interesting series or themes or discussions that you can have along the way. And uh, again, the ultimate goal is is for your members to find value in the messages that you're putting out there. Exactly. Um, so that uh, that about wraps up our Q and A time. So thanks so much to those of you who submitted questions, and especially to our panelists for uh, for sharing your insights. Um, we appreciate all of you sticking around as we talk about one of our favorite topics. And, and thank you again um, to each of our plan panelists for being so generous with their time. Uh, here is our information one more time. We encourage you to stay connected with MindGrub and check out what's new with uh, at ASAE, the Alliance for Community Media, GMMB, and Treble. Uh, we'll be sending out a recording of today's session to all registered attendees. So do keep an eye out for that in your inbox. That'll be sometime early next week. In the meantime, make sure uh, to whitelist our email address so it doesn't get caught in your spam filter. And <laughs> thanks again uh, to all of our panelists and to all of you for joining us today. Hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks again. <laughs>